All right, this, uh, today we're gonna be talking about myology. And while I have my uh, screen share here, you could see my whiteboard, I just want to uh, draw something here for you. We're gonna be talking about shortly, I'm gonna be talking about muscles of mastication. Uh, muscles of mastication are muscles around the jaw that will help you chew. So we call it mastication. And I refer to them as time muscles. T, I, M, E, time muscles. So I'm just drawing this out now so that when I'm going through the pictures of the muscles, uh, you can reflect back on this or if you wanna write it down on a sheet of paper, you can. So time muscles are the four muscles of mastication. The T is for temporalis. That's the temporalis muscle. The M is for masseter muscle. And now we're left with the I. What does the I stand for? And what does the E stand for? So the I stands for internal pterygoid, internal pterygoid. And the way you spell pterygoid is P, T, E, R, Y, G, O, I, D. Sorry, I'm using my mouse pad. I don't have a stylus. So internal pterygoid. And then the E would be for external pterygoid. Same word. Now, sometimes the internal pterygoid is referred to as the medial, right? Because internal, another word for saying internal would be medial. So it can be referred to as the medial pterygoid. And then the other way of saying external would be lateral pterygoid. Okay? So you have lateral pterygoid, and then you have medial pterygoid. So those are the four muscles of mastication. Again, it would be the temporalis, internal pterygoid, also known as the medial pterygoid, masseter, and external pterygoid, also known as the lateral pterygoid. Those are muscles of chewing. So when I go over them, We'll think of these, and what's interesting about these muscles is that they're innervated by cranial nerve, CN will be for cranial nerve number five. When we talk about cranial nerves in neurology, uh, there are 12 pairs of cranial nerves, and we talk about them in Roman numeral. Cranial nerve five is known as the trigeminal nerve. Trigeminal because it has three divisions three divisions, one division going to the eye, near the eye, called the ophthalmic division, the other division going to the maxilla, called the maxillary division, and then the third division going to the mandible, called the mandibular division. So it's the tri, because it's three divisions, trigeminal nerve, an ophthalmic division, maxillary division, and mandibular division. This is the cranial nerve, that doesn't only control chewing, these four muscles of mastication, but it controls the sensation of what you feel to the face. So when you go to the dentist and the, you have a cavity and they wanna fill the cavity, it's the trigeminal nerve they hit with Novocaine to make half your face go numb. It's the trigeminal nerve. Okay, so that was the first thing that I wanted to mention to you. Now, the second thing that I wanted to mention to you is when we talk about rotator cuff muscles, which are muscles around the shoulder, around the scapula, uh, the rotator cuff muscles originate, most of them originate off of the scapula, but will insert onto the humerus. And when we did osteology, in the proximal humerus, there were two important landmarks towards the proximal portion of the humerus, right? There was the head of the humerus 
And then below that, you had a greater and lesser tubercle. And between the greater and lesser tubercle was a groove called the bicipital groove or the intertubercular groove. So when we talk about the rotator cuff muscles, there is the supraspinatus, the infraspinatus, the teres minor, I'll put a small m for minor, and subscapularis. So we call them the sits muscles. Sometimes you hear them as the sits because it's the supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor, and the subscapularis. Supraspinatus and infraspinatus. Remember the landmark, there is a landmark on the scapula known as the spine of the scapula. So if the muscle is above the spine of the scapula, remember the spine becomes the acromion process on the top. So if it's above it, it's the supraspinatus. And if it's below the spine of the scapula, it's the infraspinatus. Okay. So those are the sits muscles. <clears throat> and three of them, these three, you can see from the posterior. And the last one, the subscapularis, we can see from the anterior scapula. The next thing that's important to know is that the first three, the first three will insert on the greater tubercle. So the first three, the supraspinatus, infraspinatus, and teres minor, will all insert onto the greater tubercle of the humerus, greater tubercle. The subscapularis right here, that one is going to insert on the lesser tubercle of the humerus, lesser tubercle of the humerus. Okay. Let's talk about origins. So we talked about insertions. Let's talk about the origins, where the muscles begin. Three of them are going to originate on the fossa that sounds very similar to the name of the muscle. So if you go back to osteology and we go back to the fossas of the scapula, there was the supraspinous fossa, infraspinous fossa, subscapular fossa. So guess where the supraspinatus muscle is going to originate? On the supraspinous fossa. Where will the infraspinatus muscle originate? On the infraspinous fossa. Guess where the subscapularis originates? Subscapular fossa. So three of the four muscles originate on their corresponding fossa. The teres minor is the only one that does not originate on a fossa, and I'll show you uh, where the muscle it will be located. The next thing I want to show you are actions of the muscles. So um, let me do this again. Let me go back here and do supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor, subscapularis. We said the top three, insert on the greater tubercle. The last one inserts on the lesser tubercle. And we said the supraspinatus, infraspinatus, and subscapularis originate on their corresponding fossas. Supraspinous fossa, infraspinous fossa, subscapular fossa. The next thing I wanted to go over is the actions. The supraspinatus abducts the shoulder, so AB. In fact, let's make it simple and because I'm going to, let's just call it AB for abduction. Then it's EX for external rotation, and then EX again for external rotation and then IN for internal rotation. 
So if you can see me, right, because I, if you can see me move my arm, this is abduction. Right? Going from here to here is abduction. Going from here to here is external rotation. And going this way is internal rotation. The reference point is the greater tubercle. So if the greater tubercle goes laterally or externally, that's external rotation. When the greater tubercle moves inward, it's internal rotation. So we have AB, EX, EX, IN in order, right? If we go sits, the supraspinatus abducts, infraspinatus externally rotates, teres minor externally rotates, but the subscapularis internally rotates. So it goes like this, AB, EX, EX, IN. A, B, E, X, E, X, I, N. A, B, E, X, E, X, I, N. Abduction, external rotation, external rotation, internal rotation. Those are the actions of the rotator cuff muscles. What's interesting is they're called rotator cuff muscles, but the supraspinatus doesn't rotate. Right? Only the infraspinatus, teres minor, and subscapularis rotate. The supraspinatus is an abductor of the shoulder. It initiates abduction. So the first about 15 degrees or so when you're in like neutral position like here and you bring your arm out, that's supraspinatus. After that angle, the rest of the way of abduction is the middle deltoids. The deltoid has anterior division, a middle division, and a posterior division. So the middle division abducts the shoulder. Okay, so that's what I wanted to show you on the whiteboard. Now I'm going to go into my screen capture and we're going to go into the PowerPoint. <clears throat> okay. So we're going to start the PowerPoint. And we're just going to go over some of these muscles. And these are muscles that have showed up on past exams. And we know that sometimes things get recycled. Um, there are test banks and they just pop up. So let's go through some of these and teach around some of the older uh, questions. and then. Um, it'll help you kind of study and go, okay, let's study some of the muscles around this as well. So here around the temporal region, right? Here's the frontal bone. Here's the occipital bone. This is the parietal bone. And down here is the temporal bone. So this muscle is named by its location, the temporalis, right? So it says which structure is highlighted. This muscle is the temporalis. It actually attaches to the mandible. And when you put your hand above your ears or behind your eyes, posterior to your eyes, and you clench your teeth, right? Right here, let's say a person was wearing glasses. Right here in this area, you can actually feel the muscle contract. You can feel it bulging out when you bite and clench your teeth. That's the temporalis. It is a powerful uh, muscle of mastication. So here is the temporalis. Here is the masseter. Here is the lateral and medial pterygoids. You remember what their other names were? The other name for lateral pterygoid was the external pterygoid. And the other name for medial pterygoid is internal pterygoid. Now this week, I treated uh, yesterday, it was uh, Sunday. No, uh, yeah, today's Monday. So Sunday, yesterday, I had a patient that came in that had a bad case of TMJD, temporal mandibular joint dysfunction. And every time they opened and closed their jaw, there was clicking and clunking that was happening at this tempro, tempro mandibular joint. And 
when this muscle here goes into spasm, right, if there's some sort of trauma, someone gets hit in the jaw, someone is not paying attention and they're not watching where they're walking and then they turn and they hit, they hit a pole or a bar or something with their face or glass, it's very easy to dislocate the jaw really quickly and then the muscles go into spasm. And the way to treat this and to treat it successfully is simply intraorally. So I have put on a glove on my hand, have the patient open up their mouth, and I follow the upper jaw right to the last molar, right, where the wisdom teeth are. And I point my finger upward to try and release this lateral pterygoid. Works like a charm. Typically brings people to tears. It is one of the most painful myofascial release triggers that there are in the body. And part of the autonomic phenomenon of of the trigger point that is associated with this muscle is that it makes the eyes water. Um, there is, there was a, uh, a woman physician to the White House. She was actually the first lady physician to any president of the United States. And her name was Dr. Janet Travell, Dr. Janet Travell. And she was John F. Kennedy's physician. She was John F. Kennedy's physician. I had an uncle uh, who was John F. Kennedy's podiatrist. Uh, but Janet Travell wrote what we call the Bible of soft tissue trigger point therapy books. It's about two volumes, and it's kind of similar to neurology. If you understand, if someone has a pinched nerve, nerves can refer pain in very specific patterns, but so do muscles. And a lot of people are unaware of that. But every muscle has a referral pattern. And when the pterygoids or the temporalis or the masseter, when they have dysfunction, there could be trigger points that can refer pain to other parts of the body. So um, in any manner, Janet Travell, if you ever want to Google it or look it up, it's fascinating. I used to teach a course called trigger point therapy. Okay, so these are the four uh, pterygoid muscles, temporalis, internal pterygoid, masseter, and external pterygoid. These are all your chewing muscles. These open and close the jaw. These can open and close as well, but it deviates the jaw side to side, right? You don't just chew up and down. Your jaw does deviate sideways. Okay, so what structure is highlighted here? This one is going to be the lateral pterygoid. I'm sorry, this one here, my bad. This one here is the lateral pterygoid. This one here is the medial pterygoid. Lateral, you can see how the mandible is cut here, like they took a saw and they cut the mandible here and here so we could see deeper. So in alignment with the maxilla is the lateral pterygoid, and then going downward in this direction is the medial pterygoid. This one here is called a buccinator muscle, the buccinator. If you were to blow into a trumpet and your cheeks puff out, that's the function of the buccinator. It puffs out the cheek. That's the buccinator. Lateral pterygoid, medial pterygoid. So in this close-up view, here's the temporalis. We'll talk about the eye muscles shortly. Uh, here's the orbicularis oris going around the lips. Here's the buccinator. Here's a medial pterygoid. And here's the uh, mandibular condyle, and just inferior to it, it's cut. Here are a bunch that you can see under the jaw, and I you don't necessarily have to know their, their functions for these. You don't really, I don't see test questions coming up too much on functions, but pure identification, yes. Um, I've seen the digastric come up a few times. The digastric has two heads. Digastric looks like it goes through a, a pulley in here. Um, this is the hyoid bone, 
right? The only muscle in the body that doesn't attach to any other bone. So there's lots of muscles that attach to it. And you could see the word hyoid in many of them, right? Like Milohyoid, stylohyoid, sternohyoid, thyrohyoid, right? Going from the thyroid cartilage to the hyoid bone, thyrohyoid. Go geniohyoid, going from the tongue to the hyoid. Stylohyoid, remember the mastoid process and then medial to it is the styloid process. So stylohyoid going from the styloid process to the hyoid bone. Sternohyoid, going from the sternum to the hyoid bone. All right, so just kind of be a little bit familiar with them. So when we look here, this one is the geniohyoid. This is the geniohyoid. This one here is the mylohyoid. Mylohyoid. This one here is the digastric, digastric. Now, besides some of those muscles of the jaw, it's important to know some of the neck muscles and orient, being able to orient ourselves and, and, and know what is superficial and what is deep. So if we look here from the posterior, here's the scapula. Right, And on the right-hand side, you could see the scapula. But the right side and the person's left side, they look a little bit different. Why do they look different? Because this large muscle here called the trapezius, which is superficial, is intact, whereas on this side, it's dissected away. And on the right-hand side, when you dissect it away, you can see what is deep to it. So here's the trapezius, and there's upper fibers of the traps, and then there's middle fibers of the traps, and there's lower fibers of the traps. Once that's dissected away, we can see what's deeper. Going from the spine to the medial border or vertebral border of the scapula are the rhomboids, which gets its name because it's rhomboid-shaped. There's a rhomboid minor. And then below it, a rhomboid major. Remember, minors are above majors. So rhomboid minor originates at about C7 and T1 spinous process, C7 and T1, and then it goes to the vertebral border, pretty much to the root of that spine of the scapula, but on the medial border of the scapula. Below the rhomboid minor is rhomboid major. That's about T2 to T5. So T2, T3, T4, and T5 spinous process, again, to the vertebral border of the scapula. When this muscle contracts, it's going to pull the scapula to the spine. We call it adduction, adduction. But at the same point in time, if you look at the fibers, the direction of the fibers, they run up to down. If the bottom portion of the scapula moves upward, then that means the glenoid cavity is going to rotate and point downward. So they call that downward rotation of the scapula because the reference point is the glenoid cavity or the glenoid fossa, right? If this part at the inferior angle rotates up like a steering wheel, the top hand has to go down, okay? Another muscle here is the levator scapula. That goes from the upper four cervical vertebrae, C1, 2, 3, 4. And look at the name, levator scapula. It elevates the scapula. It attaches to the superior angle of the scapula. When this muscle contracts, it shrugs your shoulder up. It does scapula elevation, levator scapula. Okay, if we look on the left-hand side, from the lateral view, right, you could see a little bit of the trapezius. Now, what's really neat about this is that embryologically, embryologically, the traps and the SCM start out as one unified muscle. But embryologically, when the baby is growing inside the mother's womb and the clavicle starts to grow, 
then this and this, right, the SCM and the trap separate. They split and they pull apart, and now we have two separate muscles, the sternocleidomastoid, because it originates on the sternum, clido for clavicle, and it inserts on the mastoid process. So it's called the sternocleidomastoid. Okay. And then, you know, underneath here is, you know, the digastric, the stylohyoid, geniohyoid, mylohyoid. Under um, another big muscle here, again, you have to dissect the trapezius away, splenius capitis. It goes from the cervical vertebra, capitis is, is the occiput, it's your skull. Deep to these, deep to the splenius capitis, we have what's referred to as suboccipital muscles. The reason why that's important is many times if you're getting into nursing, you'll hear of people being diagnosed with suboccipital migraines or suboccipital headaches, or if they ask the patient, uh, where do you feel your headache? Where is it coming from? And they point to the occiput or behind the head, they'll say, oh, it's suboccipital. Sub meaning under the occiput. Okay, suboccipital. Now, clinically speaking, there is a, an amazing muscle in here called rectus capitis posterior minor. Rectus capitis posterior minor. It's one that you'll want to write down. You probably will never get tested on it here, but clinically, it's it's so very important. The sub the rectus capitis posterior minor was discovered about 20, 25 years ago. Not the muscle was discovered, but a neurological attachment of that muscle. Remember, most muscles attach to bones but they found a soft tissue attachment from rectus capitis posterior minor going to one of your meninges. Can you believe that? They found a muscle that has a soft tissue bridge that connects to the meninges, which makes the suboccipital migraine really powerful because now when you have tension on these muscles and that muscle can pull on the, or torque the spinal cord and brain, that's a major issue. All right, so that's a little clinical gem I give you just to whet your appetite there. So here, we're looking at a muscle that's going from the sternum and the clavicle up to the SCM. If they gave you choices here like platysma, traps, levator scapula, or SCM, sternocleidomastoid, ding, 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 sternocleidomastoid. Now we're looking at the person from the front. Here's the orbicularis oris. Here's the nasalis. Um, here is your uh, orbicularis uh, oris. This is orbicularis oculi. I, I think I may have said orbicularis oris. This is orbicularis oculi, for oculi for eye, going around the lips, orbicularis oris. Okay. Now, what we see highlighted here in purple, well, let's see if we could just kind of figure it out. Uh, Terry's minor, no. Platysma, no. Thyrohyoid, anything attaching to the hyoid, no. Sternothyroid, no. Has to, has to be um, the scalenes. Now, we haven't done the scalenes, so let's take a look at the scalenes because these are clinically important as well. So the scalenes, I call them the scalene sisters. There's three of them. You have scalenius anticus, scalenius medius, and scalenius posticus. I'm a little old school in my terminology. Um, it's just how I learned it. But scalenius anticus is scalenius anterior. Scalenius medius is scalenius middle. Scalenius posticus is the scalenius posterior. These rotate the cervical spine, but here's what's amazing about these muscles. They create a sandwich. Okay, what are they sandwiching? It's like two slices of bread here, scalenius anticus and medius, the top and bottom slice of bread. And, and what's between it is the brachial plexus. Now, the brachial plexus is a group of nerves that come from C5, C6, C7, C8, and the T1 
nerve roots. These are nerve roots that come out of the spinal cord. So from C5, C6, C7, C8, and T1 nerve roots. I didn't say C8 vertebra, because there's only seven cervical vertebra, but there are eight cervical nerve roots. Look, they pierce between these two muscles. So if these muscles are hypertrophied or thickened, it can compress the brachial plexus, referring pain down the upper arm. Or it can also compress the subclavian artery, creating issues of circulation problems. They call it thoracic outlet syndrome when it happens. So here's just another view, scalenius anterior, scalenius medius, here's the brachial plexus. So if these muscles thicken or hyper sleep on your stomach, with your head turned or rotated to the side, you can actually go numb going down your fingers. You ever sleep? With, on your stomach and your arm under the pillow, and then you wake up and your hand is numb, that is called thoracic outlet syndrome. Sometimes it's from compressing the brachial plexus here by the scalenes, and sometimes it's the pec minor muscle that's compressing the brachial plexus. Because pec minor is deep to pec major, and it goes from ribs three, four, and five to the coracoid process and creates a roof of which the brachial plexus goes under that. So when the humerus or the arm abducts above the shoulder like your arm under the pillow, you can stretch it and get numb and tingly. So again, here is the brachial plexus. You can see it going right down underneath pec minor. On the top one, you can see piercing between the scalenes on the top left, right? But it also goes under pec minor, not just the nerve, but also the arteries. So you can get numbness, numbness or tingling down the inside of the arm to the pinky and the ring finger. Typically, it's on the medial aspect. And you can get a poor uh, radial pulse. And you can get poor circulation into the fingers. They call it thoracic outlet syndrome. Okay, what is the origin of this highlighted muscle? Now, even if you didn't know the name of the muscle, we can, and they give you choices. Okay, what is the origin of this? Is it the frontal lobe? Eh. Is it the temporal lobe? Eh. Is it the nasal bone? Eh. Is it the zygomatic bone? Ding, 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 right? Zygomatic arch, you know, is here. So it would be the zygomatic bone or zygomatic arch. This happens to be zygomaticus major. There's a zygomaticus minor as well. What structure is highlighted? Okay, if I gave you choices here. If I said um, occipitalis, no. If I said the frontalis, no. If I said splenius capitis, no. If I said upper trapezius, no. What if I said levator scapula? Yes, this would be the levator scapula muscle going from C1, 2, 3, 4, 5, uh, C1 through C4, transverse processes, and it inserts on the superior angle. And when someone asks you a question and you say, I don't know, and you shrug your shoulders up, that's exactly what the muscle does. So now it's asking, what is the insertion of this muscle? So it's the same muscle as you see here, but now it's asking, what's the insertion? Well, let's see if we could figure it out. Is it the acromion process of the scapula? No. Spine of the scapula? No. Mastoid process of the temporal bone? No. Occipital protuberance? No, the occipital protuberance is here. Superior angle and medial border of the scapula? Yes. That's exactly where levator scapula inserts. Let's look at some of the eye muscles now. Really cool, the eye has six muscles. Four of them have the word um, rectus in it, like superior rectus, inferior rectus, medial rectus, and lateral rectus. And what's cool is that the rectuses are named by where it's located. So it's above the eye, superior rectus. Below the eye, inferior rectus. On the medial aspect, medial rectus. On the lateral aspect, lateral rectus. So those are four of the six. 
The other two muscles are called obliques, a superior oblique and an inferior oblique. The superior oblique goes on this oblique angle, right? It goes through this pulley called the trochlea. And then the inferior oblique runs this way. Let's look at the eye here. Let's see if we can, so now you can see the, the nose, so you know this is medial, which means this is lateral. So lateral rectus, medial rectus, superior rectus, inferior rectus. Those are the four of the six. Now we have two obliques, superior oblique, inferior oblique. Let's see if we can name this one. Here's the nasal bone. That's the superior rectus, lateral rectus, superior oblique, inferior oblique. So this one here has to be the inferior rectus. Again, here's the nasal bone. So this is medial. We can't really see the medial rectus. We could see the superior rectus. We could see lateral rectus. We could see inferior rectus, inferior oblique. So what's this one? Superior oblique. Again, same view. We could see lateral rectus, superior rectus, superior oblique, inferior oblique. These create torsion of the eye. Right, like if you're on the if your head is looking straight, but then you're holding the cell phone and you bring your right ear to your right shoulder, your eyes can torque and rotate the other way so you don't lose your balance while you're walking. Okay, let's look at the arm and shoulder. I want you to look at the left hand side, the reading left, so we can look at superficially what's on the reading right are deeper muscles deep to what's here. So pectoralis major is superficial, so is the deltoid superficial, and in front of the arm, biceps brachii. The term bicep, bi, means two, and there are two heads, a long head and a short head of the biceps. Let's peel away these muscles on the left so we can see what's deep on the right. Now you'll notice on the right-hand side, we have the ribs here that are cut. If the ribs are cut, it gives us a better view of the scapula. But now we're looking at the scapula from the anterior perspective. We don't see it from the posterior. We're seeing it from underneath surface. So the underneath is the subscapularis. That's the rotator cuff muscle that originates on the subscapular fossa in terms of sits, S-I-T-S, it's the last S, subscapularis. It is an internal rotator of the shoulder. And it inserts on the lesser, tro, uh, lesser tubercle. Okay, what do we see in the front here? We see the biceps brachii. The biceps have two heads. There is a short head that originates on the coracoid process. And then there's a long head that goes through the bicipital groove and it originates on the supraglenoid tubercle. The supraglenoid tubercle is just a little bump on the top of the glenoid fossa, or on top of the glenoid cavity. So there's a long head, and then there's a short head. There's another important muscle that originates on the coracoid process, and it is given its name by its origin and insertion. So it goes from the coracoid process to the arm, which is called the brachium. So it's called a coracobrachialis, coracobrachialis. Okay, let's look on the left-hand side again. We can see the trapezius. We can see the deltoid since it's the posterior, right? It says back view. This is the posterior deltoid. And right there would be the middle deltoid. If a muscle's in the back, it pulls the limb to the back, so that would extend the shoulder. If the muscle's in the front, it pulls the shoulder to the front. That's called shoulder flexion. When we dissect the trapezius away, we can now see the levator scapula. 
going from C1, 2, 3, and 4 transverse processes to the superior border and medial border of the scapula, and it elevates the scapula. With the trapezius dissected, you could see the two rhomboid muscles, rhomboid minor, rhomboid major. Remember, minors are above major. Now we can see three of the four rotator cuff muscles because with the trapezius dissected away, now we can see the scapula. We can see the spine of the scapula, which is a major reference point because above the spine of the scapula is the supra, means above, supraspinatus. Below it, infraspinatus muscle. And then right here is your teres, let's look at it, teres minor. Remember, minors, even on the rhomboid side, minors are above majors. Minors are above majors. So here's teres minor, teres major. Teres major is not a rotator cuff muscle, though only teres minor. So sup, uh, supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor, S-I-T. Abduction, external rotation, external rotation. A-B, E-X, E-X, I-N. Subscapularis does I-N for internal rotation. The other interesting thing, if you look at the triceps, which is on the back of the arm, opposite of bicep, bicep has two heads, tricep has three. It has a long head, it has a lateral head, and then there's a medial head that's a little bit deeper. Okay? Has a medial head that's a little bit deeper. What's interesting is that the long head gets sandwiched between teres minor and teres major. It gets sandwiched right between the two. So we have levator scapula, rhomboid minor, rhomboid major, infraspinatus, teres minor, teres major. Which one of the two is a rotator cuff muscle? Teres minor. AB for abduction, EX, EX for external rotation, IN, internal rotation, subscapularis. Subscapularis inserts on the lesser tubercle, supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor, all insert onto the greater tubercle of the humerus. The other large muscle that I didn't mention is the lats, the latissimus dorsi. It's the widest muscle of the back. Widest muscle. Looks like a back muscle, but it really extends the shoulder. It goes underneath and attaches to the bicipital groove and it extends the shoulder as if you're trying to start a lawnmower. When you pull that cord and pull it back, that extends your shoulder. The lats helps you do a pull-up, right? When you're doing a pull-up or a chin-up, that is the latissimus dorsi. So again, the rotator cuff muscles, take a look. You got the supraspinatus on the top right, infraspinatus, teres minor, and on the left-hand side, it's the anterior view, so that's the subscapularis. On the right-hand side, supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor, insert to the greater tubercle, whereas on the left, the subscapularis inserts on the lesser tubercle. Right between the lesser tubercle and greater tubercle is the bicipital groove, which is where the long head of the biceps travels through. Here is the coracoid process. Here is the acromion process. So the coracoid process, that's where the coracobrachialis originates, and it's where the short head of the bicep originates. AB, EX, EX, IN. Abduction, external rotation, external rotation, internal rotation. When we look here, we're looking at the anterior right up at top. Here's a sneak peek at the sternocleidomastoid. This is just the distal portion. Here's the sternal division and the clavicular division. And then here is the pec major on both sides, pec major. That's your deltoid. That's the deltoid muscle. This is your pec major, but it's asking what is the action? Pec major adducts the shoulder. 
It brings the shoulder to midline. And it internally rotates the shoulder. It internally rotates the shoulder because it goes from here and it inserts on the bicipital groove. So it'll rotate the humerus medially or internally. Here is, let's see if we can identify the muscle first. That's the latissimus dorsi. And here it's asking for the action. So although it's a back muscle, remember it inserts into the humerus and it is a powerful shoulder extensor. Think of pulling that cord when you start a lawnmower or doing a pull-up or a pull-down at the gym, if you would. Powerful shoulder extender. And much like the pectoralis major, it is an adductor of the shoulder as well. Shoulder adduction or adduction. If you need a review on the ranges of motion, make sure you go to my YouTube channel. I go through and I perform on myself all the ranges of motion from the cervical spine to the shoulder to the scapula to the uh, forearm to the wrist to the fingers to the thumb to the hip to the knee to the foot to the toes i go through all the ranges of motion on a separate video what is the structure highlighted here we see the scapula we see the spine we see the muscle is above it so i'm thinking infraspinatus no teres minor no uh, brachialis? No. Subscapularis? No. We got to go with what? Supraspinatus. It's above the spine of the scapula. What about here? Here's the posterior scapula. There's the spine of the scapula. What would this be? It would have to be infraspinatus. Here's teres minor. Here's teres major. Here's the long head of the triceps. Here's the levator scapula, rhomboid minor, rhomboid major. Minors are always above majors. And there's your latissimus dorsi. It's asking for the insertion of the highlighted muscle. All right, well, I gave you, you know, Linder's technique, right? Dr. Linder's technique of how to remember their origins and insertions. We can't see the screen. Okay. Okay, let me go back one just in case. Infraspinatus. Rhomboid minor, rhomboid major. Minors are always above majors. Teres minor, teres major. Minors are always above major. Long head of the triceps, lateral head of the triceps. Spine of the scapula, supraspinatus. It's asking for the insertion. So it looks like it's inserting somewhere on the humerus. Is it the shaft of the humerus? No. Superior angle of the scapula? No. Head of the radius? No. We got to choose between greater and lesser tubercle. What I told you was sit, supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor, insert on the greater tubercle. The subscapularis is the only one that inserts on the lesser tubercle. Now it's asking the origin of the muscle. So we've seen name the muscle. What is its insertion? Now it wants to know the origin. The origin is on the fossa, supraspinous fossa. What's the highlighted muscle? This one, here's the spine of the scapula, here's infraspinatus, here's the long head. I said the long head of the triceps pierces between teres minor, teres major, minors are always above majors. Ah. Tricky, tricky, tricky. What's the highlighted structure? We see the clavicle. We see the, re the uh, rectus abdominis. I could see the scapula. So what is the muscle that is in front of the scapula? It's a rotator cuff muscle. That's called the subscapularis, subscapularis. What is the origin of this muscle? Okay, well, this is the minor, rhomboid minor. 
Rhomboid minor is C7 and T1. Spinous process as the origin. The insertion is the vertebral border of the scapula, a.k.a. medial border. If it was rhomboid major, it's T2 to T5 spinous to the vertebral border. And then it makes the rhomboidous shape that we see here. So what's the highlighted structure here? Well, this one was rhomboid minor. This one here would have to be rhomboid major. Okay, tricky, tricky, tricky. Um, you just have to look at this muscle, look it up to understand it, but this one is serratus anterior. It originates on the ribs, the upper six ribs. It wraps around to the posterior thorax and it attaches to the scapula that we see back here, but on the medial border of the scapula, right? So it's tricky because you're only seeing the origin of it. You can't quite see the insertion, but it is the only one that you can go with of these choices. It's not rectus abdominis. It's not the subscapularis. If it was the internal intercostals, you wouldn't be able to see them because they're deep in the ribs. Can't be pec minor, so it's serratus anterior, best choice. So now it's asking again, here's the serratus anterior, what's the insertion? The origin is the upper six ribs. The insertion is the vertebral border of the scapula, AKA medial border of the scapula. Okay, so now what we're looking at, we went through the upper two already, right? We saw the rotator cuff, we saw the triceps, we saw the biceps. Let's focus on the forearm for a second because there are some important forearm muscles. On the left, it's the anterior, lower left is the anterior forearm. The lower right is the, also the forearm. It is superficial, but we're looking the, at the back of the hand. So anything that's on the front of the forearm that crosses the wrist, that crosses the carpals, is a flexor muscle. It's got the word flexor in it. Anything on the back of the hand or the back of the forearm that crosses the carpals and wrist is going to have the word extensor in it. So extensors are on the back of the forearm. Flexors tend to be on the front of the forearm. The other thing I want to point out is near the cubital fossa, which is this depression here where they typically take blood from you, there is a pronator teres and the brachioradialis, right? It kind of makes like a, a Y, right? Here and here or a V, if you would. The pronator teres and the brachioradialis, just two important landmark muscles here. But where the pronator teres originates happens to be the same place as all these other flexors here. Pronator teres, palmaris longus, flexor carpi ulnaris, uh, flexor digitorum superficialis, they all originate off of that medial epicondyle, which is the distal part of the humerus on the medial side. So they all originate, all the flexors of the wrist and fingers originate off the medial epicondyle. Whereas the majority of the extensors originate near the lateral epicondyle. Anything on the posterior side extends the wrist, extends the fingers. Anything on the anterior wrist flexes the wrist, flexes the fingers. They're antagonistic to one another. So we're going to go over muscles like uh, extensor digitorum, which extends the digits. We'll go over flexor, carpi ulnaris, uh, pronator teres, brachioradialis. We're going to go through some of these. So you may have to refer back to the forearm flexors uh, and forearm extensors, meaning muscles of the anterior forearm or muscles of the posterior forearm. Anterior forearm, flex the wrist, flex the fingers. 
posterior forearm, extend the wrist, extend the fingers. Just knowing that can help you select the names of the muscles. All right, so now it says name the highlighted structure. Well, we're looking at the anterior arm. It looks like the biceps brachii, but one of the heads is highlighted. Not this one, this one. So this one is the long head. It goes through the bicipital groove. This one's the short head of the bicep. Originates on the coracoid process. What is the highlighted structure? Let's look at the choices. It's the back, back of the arm. That's where the triceps brachii is. Long head, lateral head. What is the action of the triceps? Well, it's on back of the arm. So anything on the back of the arm has to extend. So it extends the shoulder and it extends the elbow. It extends the shoulder and it extends the elbow. Two actions. General rule of thumb, if a muscle crosses a joint, it has to act on the joint. If a muscle's in the front, it has to pull the limb to the front. If a muscle's on the back, it pulls the limb to the back. If the muscle's on the outside, it pulls the limb to the outside. Now you just have to know the names of what those actions look like. You make sure, okay, so now we're still looking at the triceps, but now it wants to know this head. Here's the infraspinatus, here's teres minor, here's teres major, between teres minor, teres major, long head of the triceps, that's the lateral head of the triceps. Now, tricky, we haven't done this one yet. It's in the anterior arm. Well, there's the biceps brachii, but no, that doesn't look like it. Well, let's see if we can figure it out. We know it's not the biceps brachii because it crosses the shoulder and this one's not. Can't be the deltoid, that's out here. Can't be the triceps because I see the rectus abdominis, triceps is a posterior muscle. Can't be subscapularis because that's right here on the anterior scapula. The only thing left is the brachialis, the brachialis. It is a powerful elbow flexor. It crosses the elbow as a belly of a muscle, not so much just a tendon. It's a strong, powerful elbow flexor. Now it's asking, what is the insertion of this muscle? Where does the, the brachialis insert? Well, the brachioradialis is on the radius. The biceps brachii is on the radius. But the insertion of the brachialis is on the proximal ulna, near the coronoid process. What is the action of the brachioradialis? So here's the brachioradialis. It's an elbow flexor. It crosses the elbow. I call it the politician muscle because it's the handshaking muscle. Politicians love to shake hands. So it's the politician muscle. It flexes the elbow in the neutral position, in the handshaking position. What is the origin of the brachioradialis? Well, the origin is on the distal end of the humerus, and the insertion is on the styloid process of the radius. The brachioradialis is the only muscle in the body the only muscle in the body that originates from the distal end of one bone and goes to the distal end of another. It's the only muscle in the body that goes from the distal end of one bone, meaning the distal humerus, to the end of the other bone, the distal radius. So the origin of the brachioradialis is just above that lateral epicondyle of the humerus. Okay, we're looking at the anterior hand here, and this muscle happens to be the pronator teres. What does this pronator teres muscle do? It pronates your arm. Remember, if your elbow is flexed and you're holding stoop, your hand is in a supinated position. When your hand rotates over, like you're spilling the soup, that's pronation. You're prone to spilling the soup if your hand rotates so that your palm faces down, pronator teres. Break your radialis would be on this side that's cut. 
Okay, it's asking here, what's the action? Oh, this is a give me, right? What is the action of the supinator muscle? The supinator muscle will supinate the forearm, which is antagonistic to the pronator teres. Pronator teres pronates the forearm. Supinator supinates the forearm. Gosh, that would be great if that shows up on the test. What is the structure? Okay, they just want you to name it. That is the supinator muscle. And this is like uh, one term they just asked you to, you know, they had the muscles off the side. You would just drag them and place them. So this is the supinator. This is the pronator teres. And there's another pronator down at the distal end of the wrist called the pronator quadratus because it has four sides, quad, pronator quadratus. It would be near the watch band, just proximal to the watch band area but it still pronates the forearm or the wrist. Okay, we're still looking at the anterior forearm, and now we have to name this. This muscle is crossing the wrist and going to the digits. So if it attaches to a carpal bone, then it's going to be like flexor carpi ulnaris. So it's not that. We know it's not the pronator teres, Palmaris longus has a long tendon that crosses the palm, but it doesn't go to the fingers. This one, you can see it's going to digits two, three, four, and five. This one is the flexor digitorum superficialis. It happens to be the largest muscle of the forearm's anterior. Flexor digitorum superficialis. Deep to the superficialis, we can't see it, would be the flexor digitorum profundus, okay? But it's deeper to that. Okay, now we're looking at the hand from the posterior side. And look, what is the action of the extensor, what is the action of the extensor digitorum muscle? So what's the action of the extensor digitorum? Rotation of the fingers? No. Flexion of the fingers? No. Adduction of the fingers? No. Depression of the fingers? It's saying, it's giving you the name of the muscle. What's the extensor digitorum going to do? It's going to extend the digits two, three, four, and five. That's a give me. Okay, this one you have to look up a little bit under the APR so you can do the dissection and anatomy and physiology revealed and plus the atlas. I want you to be able to differentiate ECRB from ECRL, the extensor carpi radialis brevis from the extensor carpi radialis longus. Now one here, I can't really zoom in too well, but it's purple here and it's purple at its uh, insertion which is very close to the third digit, which is the longer bone, right? It's the longest finger. The muscle that attaches to the longest finger is the shortest muscle, extensor carpi radialis brevis. If it was this one, extensor carpi radialis longus, that looks like it's on that thumb side, but it inserts to the second metacarpal, which is the shorter of the two fingers. So first digit and second digit, the second, I'm sorry, the second digit and third digit, right? The pointer versus the middle digit, the birdie. The birdie happens to be the shorter of the two tendons, but it's the longer finger. So you think opposites. Shorter tendon, longer finger. Shorter finger, longer tendon. So this would be extensor carpi radialis longus. So just make sure you can differentiate extensor carpi radialis longus from the extensor carpi radialis brevis. Okay, this was dragging. So um, they just want you to drag the appropriate box to this highlighted muscle. Now this one here is going to the thumb. We call the thumb the pollicis. Do any of these have the word pollicis in it? Well, only this one, flexor pollicis longus, and this one, flexor pollicis brevis. All right, so now you'd be choosing between this and this. But we know that the thumb is digit one, and the pinky is digit five. 
So the flexor pollock is longest, flex is the digit phalanx of the finger one. Okay, it's the only answer that fits here. <clears throat> okay, this is a posterior view. This is the thumb, this is the radius. On this side is the ulnar, so they would give you a few choices here, like palmaris longus, no. Flexor pollicus longus, no. Uh, extensor carpi radialis, no. Extensor carpi ulnaris, yes. Yes, extensors are on the posterior side. The thumb is the radial side, the pinky is the ulnar side, extensor carpi ulnaris, the only thing it could be. Okay, let's look at some of the muscles of the lower portion. So here we're looking at the lumbar spine. Here's the sacrum. Here's the iliac crest. Deep to the iliac crest is the iliacus and psoas major. Together, sometimes they call the iliacus and psoas major. They'll call it the iliopsoas. In front of the thigh, we have the longest muscle in the body called the sartorius muscle. This is called the sartorius muscle. And deep to that is the quadriceps, which are four muscles. They all have, all but one, have the word vastus in it. The most superficial in the center is called the rectus femoris. So here is the belly of the rectus femoris. It's cut, but it would go from here to here. But we see we cut it so that we can see the vastus medialis, the vastus lateralis, and this is cut so we could see the vastus intermedius. So those four muscles are called the quads, the quadriceps femoris. It's called the rectus femoris, vastus medialis, vastus lateralis, and vastus intermedius. Quadriceps all cross over the patella. The quads cross over the patella and insert on the tibial tuberosity so that when the quadricep muscle or the thigh muscles contract, it goes over this pulley, the kneecap called the patella, and inserts onto the leg, the part of the tibia called the tibial tuberosity, and it extends the leg as if you wanted to kick a football or kick a soccer ball. So those are the four quads. On the inner thigh are the adductors, adductors. Sertorius was the longest muscle in the body. Second longest muscle in the body is the gracilis. It's the most medial muscle. Next to it is the adductor longus, and above that is the pectineus. Deep to the adductor longus would be the adductor brevis, but you can't see it unless we cut through the longus. There's an adductor longus, there's an adductor brevis, and then there's the adductor magnus, which is the largest. Okay, it's pretty, pretty large muscle. This is anterior. The TFL, tensor fascia lata, this is the Starbucks muscle, tensor fascia latte. That's your uh, muscle that originates on the anterior superior iliac spine and attaches to the iliotibial tract, which is on the outer part of the thigh. Quads are anterior, hamstrings are posterior. There are four quadricep muscles, but there are only three hamstring muscles. One of them is lateral, that's called the bicep femoris, that's the large one here on the lateral side of the thigh. And then there are the two semi-sisters on the medial thigh, semimembranosus and the semitendinosus, which is here. Semitendinosus, semimembranosus. So the semi-sisters plus the bicep femoris, those three are the hamstrings. They originate on the ischial tuberosity, which is why we learn that with osteology. Originates on the ischial tuberosity, and the rectus femoris inserts on the head of the fibula. Okay. You have the gluteus muscles up here that are cut. You got the gluteus maximus, the gluteus medius, and the gluteus minimus. Obviously, if the gluteus maximus was fully intact, you wouldn't be able to see any of these deeper muscles. 
So they have to cut them to see what's deep to it. Here's the infamous piriformis muscle causing a clinical condition called piriformis syndrome, which when in spasm hits that sciatic nerve causing a type of sciatica from the piriformis. Okay, so let's look here and see if we can figure out what this is. Uh, this one here originates on the anterior superior iliac spine. It runs obliquely and attaches to the inner part of the knee, medial to the tibial tubercle. Longest muscle in the body, that's your sartorius. This is a posterior muscle. This happens to be one of your gluteal muscles called the gluteus maximus. And it's asking, what is the insertion of it? Well, let's look at the choices. Is it the iliac crest? No, that's up here. Is it the pubic crest? Well, we, we need an insertion that's somewhere on this bone called the femur. Do any of these have the word femur in it? Ah, the gluteal tuberosity of the femur. And that would make sense since this is the gluteus maximus that it would insert on the gluteal tuberosity. Now it's asking for the, identify the origin, which is the proximal attachment. So we got to come up with a name of not the distal part, but something up here. Okay, is it the greater trochanter? No. Is it the ischial tuberosity? That's down here. No. Is it the greater sciatic notch? No. Is it the lesser sciatic notch? No. Only thing it can be is the ilium. And it's the Allah of the ilium. Even if you didn't know what the Allah was, it's the only thing that originates. It's the only thing that has the ilium on it. Okay. Uh, now we're looking at the posterior. Here's the rump, right? Here's the glutes. It's cut. And now this is the right leg, the right thigh. Here's your sciatic nerve. And we're looking at the lateral hamstring, which is the bicep femoris muscle. The semitendinosus and membranosus are medial. The bicep femoris is lateral. What is the insertion of the highlighted muscle? C. This is going to be the medial hamstring. It's going to be semimembranosus or semitendinosus. Is it the head of the fibula? Well, that's lateral. Is it the lesser trochanter? That's up here. Is it the patella? No. Medial condyle of the tibia? Yep, that's medial. That's the tibia, and that's the medial condyle of the tibia. So sometimes process of elimination, even if you don't know it. What is the action of the quadriceps? The quadriceps extends your knee or extends your leg. Same thing. If you want to kick a ball, that's leg extension or knee extension. Okay. This one here, this is the adductor longus. This is the adductor brevis. So here's brevis. Here's longus. It's the adductor longus that's involved in a lot of your groin pulls, like in soccer when someone kicks really hard. It's the adductor longus. But this is the uh, adductor brevis here. Right? So here's adductor brevis. Here's adductor longus here. Okay, so now it's asking, what is the origin of the highlighted muscle? Okay, so we have to come up with an origin that's somewhere up here. Ischial tuberosity? Ischial tuberosity is here. ASIS, anterior iliac spine, that's up here. Iliac crest, that's up here. Tibial shaft, that's down here. Pubic bone, yep, only thing it could be, pubic bone. Let's look at the lower leg. We're getting close to the end. Now, in the lower leg, we have muscles in the anterior compartment of the leg, and these are called dorsiflexors. They dorsiflex the ankle. On the posterior compartment, would be plantar flexors. That would be like stepping on tippy toes. One of the most prominent muscles of the shins anterior is in front of the tibia called the tibialis anterior. 
And if there's a tibialis anterior, there's going to be a tibialis posterior, but you can't see it. It's on the back side here. So the tibialis anterior, it starts on the middle of the tibia and fibula. It comes down here and attaches to the first metatarsal and the first cuneiform. It is a powerful dorsiflexor and foot inverter. Again, if you don't know the actions, watch my video on YouTube so you know what dorsiflexion and what inversion looks like. Anything that's in the anterior compartment of the leg that crosses the ankle and goes to the toes are going to extend the toes. So it's called extensor digitorum. They're going to extend the toes. There's a muscle that just extends the great toe. So it's called the extensor hallucis. Hallucis is the toe. Pollicus is the thumb. You can see a little bit on the posterior portion, they're showing the gastrocnemius, the medial head of the gastrocnemius, and the soleus muscle. Ah, you can see a little bit of tibialis posterior here. Very little. We'll see it more from the posterior side. So now here, they're showing a large muscle on the front of the shin that's going to the first metatarsal and first cuneiform. It's not the popliteus. It's not the fibularis brevis. The fibularis longus and brevis stay purely on the outside. Fibularis longus, that's outside. Tibialis anterior, however, is the winner. Tibialis anterior. Ah, so tibialis anterior, now they want to know the insertion. Well, it's going to the first metatarsal and the first cuneiform. Well, remember the other name for the first cuneiform is the medial cuneiform. There's a medial cuneiform, an intermediate cuneiform, and a lateral cuneiform. So best answer here, metatarsal one and medial cuneiform. Can't be medial malleolus, that's up here. Can't be lateral malleolus, it's here. Can't be the calcaneus, it's the heel. Again, so, and it can't be the fifth metatarsal, that's over here. Let's look at the posterior calf. So here's the uh, pinky toe. So this is the lateral head of the gastrocnemius. Here's the medial head of the gastrocnemius. Here's the Achilles tendon, the most commonly ruptured tendon of the body. And here's the soleus. When the gastrocnemius and the soleus contract, it pulls the calcaneus upward which points the toes downward. That's called plant reflection. The outer side of the leg, which is the lateral compartment, are the fibularis longus and fibularis brevis. Sometimes they call it peroneus longus and peroneus brevis, depending on the author, depending on the textbook, they're the exact same thing. Fibularis longus is peroneus longus, Fibularis brevis is peroneus brevis. These are foot everters. They're foot everters. So now we're looking at the outside of the leg, and what I told you before, the outer portion is the peroneus muscles or the fibularis muscles. So this is the fibularis longus and fibularis brevis muscle. Now we're looking at, we took, we're going to go here. We're going to dissect the gastrocnemius and the soleus away so we can see some of the deeper muscles which are here. On the inside, this is the great toe here. And this would be the pinky toe here. The three muscles are what I call Tom, Dick, and Harry. Tom, Dick, and Harry. We have Tom, tibialis here. Dicker flexor digitorum longus, and then Harry flexor malicus, Tom Dick and Harry. The reason why I say Tom Dick and Harry is because it's actually the order from anterior to posterior. If you were to go from medial malleolus to the calcaneus, the tendons and structures are wrapped behind the medial in the order of Tom Dick and Harry. T for tibialis posterior. D, Tom Dick, was the D flexor digitorum longus. 
an, an tibial artery and tibial nerve, and then harry flexor hallucis longus. So from anterior to posterior, it's Tom, Dick, and Harry. Uh, up here in the popliteal fossa in the back of the knee is the popliteus muscle, very important muscle. I call it the key that unlocks the knee, the key that unlocks the knee. In order for the knee to flex, the knee or tibia has to immediately rotate first. It has to immediately rotate just an itsy bitsy bit. And that's why this muscle is on this diagonal because it immediately rotates the tibia, which unlocks it. Now that it's unlocked, your knee can flex. Your knee can flex unless it unlocks first. The popliteus is the key that unlocks the knee. Right in the center, you have the tibialis posterior. You have your lateral muscle, which is the flexor hallucis, but then it crosses over medial to go to the great toe. So if we look here on the posterior side, it's not the soleus, that's pretty large. It's not the fibularis brevis or fibularis longus. Those are lateral muscles. It can't be flexor digitorum longus. It's got to be tibialis posterior. This one is the flexor digitorum longus. So if we look at their orientation and I go back and forth, the tibialis posterior is more centrally located. And then as you move more medial, that's the uh, flexor digitorum longus this one. Still a posterior muscle, but goes around just behind the medial malleolus here. What is the insertion of the highlighted structure? Well, we're posterior. This is the calcaneus right here. So what is the insertion? This tendon inserts onto the calcaneus. Okay, so that would be, uh, the choice wasn't there, but it is calcaneus. All right, so now we're looking at some abdominal stuff. We can't forget the, the torso, the core. This is the rectus abdominis. What's the action of it? Well, it's gonna flex your trunk, right? It's gonna flex the trunk. It's gonna bring this bone, these bones to here, to the pubic bone when it contracts. What is the structure highlighted here? Okay, so this one going around here, if we look at these fibers, they run on an oblique angle. So it's gotta be one of the oblique abdominis. And since it's superficial, it's external abdominal oblique. Couldn't see it if it was internal. So it's your external abdominal oblique. The direction of these fibers would be if you were standing and putting your hands in your front pocket, your forearms would run in this direction. External abdominal oblique. Now we're looking at this structure in the center of the abdominal obliques. This is called the linea alba. This is called the linea alba. Now we can label a few of these. Uh, we already labeled the rectus abdominis before. The origin is the uh, pubic crest and the pubic symphysis. We did the external abdominal oblique before here. Now look at these fibers. These run transversely. So it's the transverse abdominus. Now if you compare the external oblique and the internal oblique, look at the direction of the fibers. So if we look at the right external abdominal oblique, these fibers run in, that, in a diagonal as if you were putting your hands and your forearms in your front pocket the internal oblique would run perpendicular to that, and it is. The fibers are running in the exact opposite direction, okay? Okay, so let me bring this to a pause here. See if you have any questions.